Hello, I'm Professor Donna Byrne from William Mitchell College of Law, and this is the Estates and Trusts online module about investments and diversification. In this module, we will de describe the duty to diversify, we'll explain the prudent investor rule, we will identify legal authority that requires diversification, and explain whether it is a presumption or a rigid rule, and we'll describe some controversy surrounding a strict diversification rule. Let's start with the case about the estate of Janes. Rodney Janes died in 1973. Now he had been a New York State Senator and he owned 1.8 million dollars worth of Kodak Eastman stock. Um, and don't quite remember what his role was and how that came to be. I don't know if he was affiliated with the company, but in any case, that Kodak stock made up about 70% of his estate. Now, at that time, Kodak stock was trading at $135 per share. Okay, that little camera there, that is a Kodak Instamatic 104. That was my first camera when I was about five years old. Okay, so it seems like a good thing. The estate had lots of money, um, but the Kodak stock went downhill. And by 1980, the stock price was only $47 a share. You remember what it was in the last slide? There it is, $135. That's a big drop. Now, the estate had been left to his wife, Cynthia, for her life, and the remainder to some charities. Cynthia and the charities all said that the trustees should have diversified the portfolio. And perhaps if they had, that overall portfolio would not have lost so much value. Okay, we are all really accustomed to diversified por portfolios today because a lot of us invest in mutual funds. And that's the whole point of a mutual fund. The fund holds lots of different stocks. And that way, if you only have a little bit of money to invest, you buy a piece of the fund and it's all diversified for you. Now, the trustee here said you can't fine a fiduciary for failure to diversify unless there's some extra hazard. All right? And there, in the case, they call it a surcharge, but right, that's a fine. They want the trustee to pay money. And there was a case that said something to that effect. Now, Kodak stock was a blue chip security, one of the best, one of the most solid, most reliable was very popular back then with investment advisors. It was popular with mutual funds. But the court said that New York followed the prudent person rule of investment, which goes something like this. A fiduciary holding funds for investment may invest the same in such securities as would be acquired by prudent persons of discretion and intelligence in such matters who are seeking a reasonable income and the preservation of their capital. Now let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that you are a prudent person of discretion and intelligence. Let's assume you are seeking a reasonable income and you are seeking preservation of the capital. Would you keep 70% of your wealth in one blue chip stock? The court says that the preservation of the fund and the pr procurement of a just income are primary objects of the creation of the trust. This is what it's about. It's about preservation of income, of, of, of the fund, and production of income. So, what do we do? Does that mean you sell off that blue chip stock? I mean, are you going to find anything better, really? Would you keep the wealth in the blue chip stock? Gosh, there's no clear rule here. It's a facts and circumstances matter. Um, in fact, the court even says that one of the great things about this prudent person rule is that it's not specific. It gives us some flexibility. Hmm, would you want to be a trustee if all the rules were flexible? Or would you want some guidance? Wouldn't you like to know what the rules are? So should you necessarily diversify even if you're holding a really good blue chip stock? Notice at the bottom of page 608, the court says, concentration itself may create or add to risk and essentially 
takes lack of diversification out of the prudent person equation altogether. Okay, thank goodness. They're helping us. They're saying you have to diversify. It's not prudent not to diversify. So a prudent person diversifies. And in this case, because facts and circumstances, this was too much concentration in the portfolio. Moreover, holding only growth stocks, right? Even because they, they had some other things, but they were all growth stocks. That did not provide enough income for Cynthia, the surviving spouse. We'll talk a little bit later about income and remainder and principal. So the trust, and, and there was another problem here. This trustee was a professional fiduciary, a corporate fiduciary. They're held to a higher standard, right? They hold themselves out as experts in management. And this was not a prudent corporate fiduciary. Holding only growth stocks did not provide enough income for Cynthia. So, uh, and the trustee did not exercise the due care of a corporate fiduciary. All right, I think we've covered this. Just summarizes those two. Okay, so what do we learn from this case? Well, concentration in itself is risky, even if you're concentrated in something really solid. And a prudent person, therefore, usually diversifies the portfolio. Moreover, the trustee has to balance the needs of the income beneficiary against those of the remainder beneficiary. Right? We can't just invest in growth stocks. We need to provide income for the person who's supposed to get the income. And a professional fiduciary is held to a higher standard. Of course, you know, you got to wonder, hindsight really helped a lot here. Okay, now we can look at this, the restatement. Um, now, the restatement, again, is not actually a statute. This is a statement of the law as it stands and good practices. But it's a useful guide. And you have um, the general standard of prudent investment on page 612. Does this change the rule at all, or does it just make it explicit? You going to take me out. There we go. We're supposed to invest and manage the funds of the trust as a prudent investor would. And the trustee has a duty to diversify the investments unless, under the circumstances, it's prudent not to do so. Can you think of circumstances where you wouldn't want to diversify? Hmm. What if the trust owns all of the stock of a privately owned company? Right here, actually, I looked this up. Here are some of our largest privately owned companies, and some of them right here in Minnesota. Cargill, Coke Industries, Mars, uh, yeah, not here, too bad. Price Waterhouse, Bechtel, Publix Supermarkets. Now that one actually is held by the employees um, and not by a, you know, a family or whatever. Loves Travel Stops. If you travel by car, you've probably seen their logo. Ernst & Young. And CNS Wholesale Grocers, which provides foods to a lot of big grocery chains. Those are all privately owned. So if you're, you know, if you're the family and you own privately owned stock, would you really want to diversify the portfolio? What if the trust owns Timberland? Now, um, I put, for example, the Hill Family Foundation. We've got the James J. Hill House up there on Summit. Or, yeah, I guess it's Summit. Um, Hill was in railroads, as you probably know, and the railroads out west acquired vast, vast, vast acres, uh, acreages of timberland and became quite wealthy as timber owners. Um, and the Hill Family Foundation, I think that's what it's called, it might be a trust, owns a lot of timberland. Would you really want to divest yourself of the timberland if that's what you mostly own? And finally, what if the trust or the estate owns a general store that's also the surviving spouse's residence. This is a state of Baldwin that's coming up in a, um, a few pages. As we'll see, there are some assets that really create special challenges. You can't necessarily diversify everything, um, but our general rule is we do need to diversify. Okay, moving along. Now, of course, the problem is when the market's rising, nobody minds if you're diversified or not. It's only when the trust or estate loses value and then the question is who pays? Who bears the risk of loss? Is it the beneficiaries or is it the trustee? 
it's the beneficiaries well you know sometimes loss just happens sometimes all the market goes down for everybody and we don't hold the trustee at fault for that um, but that means the beneficiaries lose value or should it be the trustee because the trustee is the one person who could have prevented the loss maybe so if you're a trustee obviously you want to avoid liability here and I think this is a good place to stop and then I will add a second part thanks for watching